I have to say, I'm a little surprised. I, I was like, if I have 10 people in the room, I will be happy. Because this is the last session of the last day. Everybody excited about what they learned this weekend? Yes. Are you ready to go back and take the world by storm with your WordPress sites? Awesome. Well, today we're going to talk about content. And seriously, like, raise your hand if that just, like, made you freak out. <laughs> like, I'm super overwhelmed, and I don't know what to do, and, and I don't know where to start. I mean, like most people, you probably, you bought your domain, and you bought your hosting, and you picked out this beautiful theme, and then you went, oh, crap, what am I going to put on it? Um, so many of us, myself included, we've been there, we've done that. So we're going to talk today about content. We've had a lot of great content talks already this weekend. Um, I know there was one specifically about video, there was one specifically about um, podcasting. Hopefully this is going to help br kind of bring everything together for you and kind of tie it up in a nice bow before you go. So content doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be intimidating. It doesn't have to make you like you're looking at that new post blinker going, what am I going to talk about? And then you go and get a cup of coffee because you don't want to deal with it. Um, I think there is fundamentally a problem with the way that we look at content. We so many times look at content like, okay, what am I going to say? What am I going to put out there? And I think we really need to change the way that we look at it. You have information to share. Information, products, services. You have something to give to the world. Your customer has a problem. As long as you keep that information to yourself, your customer's life is going to continue to suck. <laughs> think about it that way. Like if you don't put out into the world what you have and what you have to offer, your customer's life is going to still be miserable and they're still going to have this problem and they're not going to know how to solve it. You can help them solve it. If you look at it that way, you're not going to be thinking about, oh, I'm bothering them, I'm bugging them, I'm nagging them. You're thinking about it in terms of, I'm going to help them solve a problem. So, I'm not used to talking this much at once, so y'all forgive me. So, the first question you have to ask yourself is, who are you talking to? And I hear so many people say, oh, like as an example, I sell pillows. Everybody needs a pillow, so I'm talking to everybody. No, you're not. Because if you're talking to everyone, you are talking to no one. I think it's really important to remember that. And that goes for, if I say, who are you talking to, and your answer is moms, that's not a good answer. If I say, who are you talking to, and your answer is entrepreneurs, that's not a good answer. You need to narrow it down. Because if you're trying to talk to everybody who fits in that, you're not really talking to anybody. It's like having, you need to look at your content in terms of it being a personal conversation. So when you think about your customer, you need to know everything that you possibly can about them so you can talk to them in the best way possible. Your content should be a conversation, not a lecture. I'm going to say that again. Your content should be a conversation. It should not be a lecture. You're not talking at your audience. You want to invoke engagement and ask questions and say, you know, hey, have you been feeling like this? I have too. I know where you've been, and this is how I got past that. So it's a conversation. It's, it's an engagement with your audience. Um, when you t start thinking about not just who are they, but what do they like, where do they hang out, um, the problems that they're struggling, struggling with, it's going to give you topics for your content, but it's also going to give you places to go find them. Because those interests are going to translate into Facebook groups where you can find your audience in different interest related Facebook groups or associations. It's going to lead to not only how you talk to them but where you're going to find them. So, so many people are like, well I know where my my customers are, I, I know what they're doing, all that kind of stuff. I'm going to challenge you to actually put it on paper. So, I love this uh, format, it's from Digital Marketer and if you go to their website and look for their customer avatar sheet, you can download it there. Um, and I'll, talk, I'll post my slides with resources and everything um, after. The, I'll put it on uh, social media. What was, that? what was that? This is from Digital Marketer. Thank you. Digitalmarketer.com. So this goes into detail, and I know you can't read it all, but when you download it, you'll be able to read it great. Um, it even talks about, like, what are their goals? Um, what kind of books do they read? What kind of magazines? What blogs or websites do they go to? That sort of thing. Really hone in on who they are. Like, get to know them as if they are your best friend. I told somebody the other day, like, you need to be 
thinking about this avatar so much that like your spouse thinks you're having an affair type of thing. <laughs> like you need to know who this person is. Like really understand them. Get to know them. They are your best friend. Think about what you know about your best friend. You need to know at least that much about your customer and who you're going after. Okay. So um, the next question I usually get is, how am I supposed to get this information? Like really. And the thing is you have to talk to people. Talk to who your potential customers are. Go where they are and ask them questions in Facebook groups. In fact, I saved this one last night because I'm in a, a Facebook group that's for uh, female entrepreneurs, women who are starting businesses. Somebody posted last night, I'm a professional home organizer. I'm looking for some input. I'm working on some content creation. Surprise, surprise. I would love some feedback. What is your biggest organizing challenge? What are your mental blocks with this? What, what result would you like to see? Drop your answers below, or if you're interested in a quick call with me to talk about these, I would love to have that conversation. That's how you get this. You go where they're hanging out, and you say, hey, I would love to just know. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I just want to know. What are you struggling with? What is the, the problem that you're trying to fix? What is your biggest challenge in your business, in your life, in whatever it is that you're trying to address? So the other thing is you can have multiple personas that you're talking to, but I'm going to really challenge you to no more than three. Think about it even if you were at the after party last night. You're having conversations with people. If I'm standing here having a conversation with you guys, if I can have a personal, meaningful conversation with two or three people in real life. If I start talking to 10 or 12 people, it's no longer a, a personal connection. You're more broadcasting. And so I really want you to challenge, because you're going to develop a relationship with these personas. I want you to limit those to no more than two or three. And here's a couple of examples that I found. If you're familiar with HubSpot, it's a marketing website, and they divide theirs by like company size and the person's role within the organization and all that kind of stuff. I love this one. This is a coffee shop. So you've got, and give them names. So you've got Chad, who's the busy professional, and um, uh, he'll spend, he's willing to spend his money on quality food and drinks. Then you've got Sally, who's the busy mom, and Heston, I don't know where that name came from, um, <laughs> who is the coffee guru. Like, he's the one who, who like, probably roasts his own beans at home or something like that. So <laughs> limit it to three. And you can very easily have three very different personas. But when you sit down to start writing your content, it changes your world when you're sitting there going, all right, today I'm talking to Heston. And Heston has a problem with finding the perfect bean because he's very particular about the way his beans are roasted. Suddenly that changes what your content becomes. It changes the way you talk. It changes the way that you approach your content. You know, no longer are you sitting there at this flashing cursor that it's like, what in the world am I going to say? You have a person in your mind and you can imagine yourself sitting there having this conversation with Heston and, ha and telling him how you're going to fix his problem of finding the perfect bean. All right? Um, all right, so the, we've talked about our, per, our customer, identifying who our customers are. I think it's really important to, to talk about their story and think about their story. So I love this quote. In every line of copy we write, we're either serving the customer's story or we're descending into confusion. Now, I'm from Nashville, so this next part is the most important for me. You're either making music or you're making noise. If you think about all the things that are hitting our customers today, all the information that's coming at them from every angle, it's a lot of noise. And so the question is, how do you cut through that noise? You cut through that noise with story. We are hardwired to connect with stories. And so when you start thinking about your customer's story and how you can intertwine yourself into your customer's story, it makes a huge difference. You're no longer noise, you become music. You're, you know, the saxophone player in the Marta station where everybody's running to and fro and the people stop to listen to that music. All right, so think of it that way. I love Donald Miller. If you're not familiar with him, 
highly recommend. I'm not associated with his organization, I'm not associated with him or anything. I am like the biggest super fan. Um, he's got a book called Building a Story Brand or a podcast. If you don't want to do the book and you rather, if you download the podcast, start at the beginning. Because he is going to walk you through this framework. I'm going to show you a very basic framework here in just a second on the next slide. Um, but if you start with episode one, he's going to walk you through very detailed. And this will change your content life, let me tell you. Okay? Does, has anybody in here heard of Red Story Brand? Familiar with it at all? Am I, am I telling the truth? Yeah. All right. I was talking to somebody yesterday that he was like, we just completely redid our website once we found out about StoryBrand. So, I mean, literally, you're going to read this and you're going to be like, I am doing it all wrong. So here's the StoryBrand framework in a nutshell. Again, not associated with the company. So, Donald, if you're watching this video later, love you. Um, <laughs> don't sue me, please. <laughs> So this is the framework in a nutshell. And I know there's a bunch of other story frameworks and stuff. My husband keeps telling me this, this one is based on another one. I get that. This one's simple. I can understand it. That's the important part. Okay? So the way this works is every story... Oh, here's the other thing. Spoiler alert. <laughs> this is going to ruin every movie you're ever going to see and story that you read ever again. Okay? Because they're all the same. Star Wars to Tommy Boy. It's all the same framework. All right? All right. So... Your story has a hero, and that hero is deeply flawed and has a problem that they're trying to overcome or that they're trying to fix. And the hero meets a guide. The guide's been there, has the empathy, the authority. It's been there and has come through and knows, how, knows what they're dealing with. And that guide gives our hero a plan. And he calls that hero to action. And if that hero follows the plan and, and takes action, then he or she is going to either find success, wild success, and win the day, or they're going to find ultimate failure. Okay? And usually in the story what happens is they get really, really, really close to failure, and then something happens and they're yanked out and they're super successful. Okay? So the best stories, they end in success. So the way you look at this, your customer is the hero. And that's where so many people go wrong. They think they are the hero. They think they are the hero to come in with their solution, their product, and save the day. And that's not the case. You want your customer to be the hero because you want your customer to go from being stressed and frustrated and having this problem to winning the day. So you're going to be the guide. You are Yoda. Remember that part. You are Yoda. You are the one who is going to guide Luke to become the best Jedi in the world, and I'm not a Star Wars fan, so don't, I'm, I suck at that part, so. Um, but the thing is, you gotta think about, you are the guide, you are not the hero, all right? That's the biggest mistake people make in that framework. The other thing is to focus on the transformation, because people buy to become somebody better than who they are today. They want to become something that is not where they are in this moment. They're struggling with something. They see other people who seem to have it all together, and that's what they want to be. And that's what you're selling. You're helping them get from today to tomorrow. And tomorrow is their dream of what they're going to be able to do, the person they're going to be, uh, the, the person that everybody else is going to look to them as. Okay, So that aspirational identity. So focus on the transformation. Um, I've gotten off my notes, and I'm trying to go back to, like, where am I? All right. So your job is to show them how your product, your service, your business will help them become a better person. All right. So this is all great stuff for before you start creating content. You know who your customer is. You know their story. Does it feel like, okay, I can actually like have a conversation with this person. I can, I can create some content that appeals to their story and who they are and what they're looking for and all that kind of stuff. And so people get so bogged down in, well, how many times should I post? What should I post? What, you know, what about social media? Like, how many times should I be on Facebook or Pinterest or wherever? And then we start getting super overwhelmed. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to focus on Spock. I know we went from Star Wars to Star Trek. I don't know that story super well either. Um, I'm talking about one significant piece of content. All right? We're not talking about 
everything. I'm talking about focus on one significant piece of content. And when I say significant, I'm talking about something that it takes you a little while to put together. It's not just like you sit down, you type it out, boom, five minutes, I'm done. It's something that has some thought to it. It provides value to your customer, okay? One significant piece of content. Now that could be a blog post, it could be a video, it could be a podcast. I can't tell you what that is. I can't tell a room full of people because again, if you're talking to everybody, you're talking to nobody. I can't tell everybody like, okay, you need to go and write a 1500 word blog post once a week for your customers. It's going to depend on your audience. If you're talking to a busy mom, she may not have time to sit down and read a blog post, but she has time to listen to a podcast in her car as she's driving the kids around town. Um, it, it just it depends on who you're talking to, but it's going to be one significant thing that you post on a schedule that's appropriate to your audience. So when you're talking to them and you're doing that survey or posting on a Facebook group or whatever, one of the things that you can ask is, so what's what's the best way that you get your information? Like, do you prefer video or audio or reading it? I mean, ask those kinds of questions because that's going to help you figure out what your significant piece of content is. Um, you can also ask them, like, how often do you get around to your favorite websites? Do you go to them every day? Do you go to them once a week? You know, the busier they are, the less often they get to those blog posts. I can guarantee you that. So find that stuff out while you're creating your personas, and then build your schedule around that. Okay, so, yeah, there's people like Seth Godin who post on their blog every single day. I don't advise that because <laughs> life gets in the way. If you think that you can post or you want to post every day, I'm going to encourage you to start once a week. Start slow. Don't start off with these grand plans of I'm going to post you know, every other day, I'm going to post every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, whatever that is. Build up to that because I want you to have those wins when you start posting your content and you start, start sharing it and people start engaging with it. All right? I don't want you to, to set yourself up for failure. I want you to start slow and ease into it. All right? There are some people, believe it or not, I was listening to podcasts the other day, and this lady, she posts once a month on her blog. And of course, the host is like, so what happens the rest of the month? And that's where we get into sawdust. This lady posts, and I wish I could remember her name, she posts once a month. The rest of the month is all what we call sawdust. It's the stuff that kind of falls off your significant piece of content. All right. Anybody who does woodwork, when you cut the wood, there's all the stuff that flies off. It's little pieces, little shavings, all that kind of stuff. That's what you're going to post on social media. I kind of skipped over this on the last one. Social media is not the place for your significant piece of content. Because Mark Zuckerberg and his team changes their mind every week about what they're going to allow us to do. Next week, they're going to tell us that we can't post any pictures that have the color blue because suddenly blue is offensive to somebody. I mean, seriously, y'all, you have no control over social media. So don't put your most important content there. If your post is a video, if your significant piece of content is a video, then post it on YouTube, by all means. And I think you said this yesterday, you were talking about video. Then go embed it on your website. You're still going to get the views. It's still going to count on YouTube. People, when they go and search on YouTube, did you know YouTube is like the second biggest search engine? They're still going to find it on YouTube. But make sure that in the comments, you have a link back to your website. You always want to take people back to your website. Yeah, it's going to help you with SEO. Yeah, it's going to help you with everything else. But it's going to train people where to find that content in the future when the social media channels screw it up again. Okay? Always point back to your owned media. And by owned, I mean something you control 100%. Okay? Um, so yeah, social media, and I just realized that was a very low quality picture. Uh, social media is considered sawdust. It's not considered your significant content. So what do you post to social media? It's quotes from your blog, your video, your whatever, your podcast, whatever it is. It's, it's little pieces, it's little quotes. It's even like Say you post, and I'm going to use a blog post as an example. I think that's what most people 
use as their significant piece of content. So let's say you post this really long blog post, and then a couple days later you go on Facebook Live, which by the way, Facebook loves Facebook Live. You go on Facebook Live and you're going to answer uh, questions about that significant piece of content. That's sawdust. That's something that falls off. It drives people to read, go read the article first and then come and ask their questions. Okay. And if you get into a regular rhythm of that, your customers start to expect it and they're like, okay, this is great. This is how I engage with Heather, with Heather on the content that she's created and stuff like that. Um, so you've got, you can pull quotes from your videos. Um, if you do video, you can use shorter video clips. Um, if you don't like to go live on Facebook, you can do that and then, you know, use your video clips as live. Uh, even on Instagram, you can go live now. Um, you can do transcripts from your videos or your podcasts. You can even translate those into shorter blog posts. So let's say that your, your significant piece of content, your Spock, is video. You create a video or podcast or whatever, and then you take that transcript, make it shorter, make it a little two, three hundred word, you know, like one piece of the video, like the first topic that you covered, you know, it's like a, like a sermon, you've got three points, well you take point number one, make it a smaller po blog post, and that's, you know, you can actually spread that out into three blog posts from a significant video that you've invested a lot of time and effort into. There's all kinds of th ways that you can uh, create sawdust, so when you're writing your significant piece of content or creating your significant piece of content, be thinking, how can I use this in other places, and how can I use little pieces of it here and there, and drive back to that significant piece of content over and over again. All right, That's the hub and spoke model where your, that piece of content is the hub, your website is the hub, everything else points back to it. All roads lead back to your website. All right? Yeah? The Facebook live thing, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Uh -huh. Are people actually talking to you at that moment via somewhere and you say I'm going to be live? They can be, co they can be posting comments and questions as you're talking live. So you're doing live video and they can submit um, questions in the chat or, um, you know, be able to ask questions. And so you can, you know, say, hey guys, today we're talking about the first part of Monday's blog post. We're talking about... Um, I was trying to come up with a really good example, and I, like you know, let's say you're talking to moms of girls who play basketball, and so you wrote this really cool blog post about how to build a DIY basketball goal because you know moms do DIY stuff. I'm just making that up. And so today we're going to talk about step one and two of how to create that basketball goal. And so you know you're putting it together, and they're asking questions, and you're pointing things out and stuff like that. So that that's just something that you can do. So you must let them know in advance that you're going to be live like at two o'clock. You don't have to. So that's the cool thing about Facebook Live is that people who follow you on Facebook, it'll send them a notification that you're live. Okay. You. So you can schedule it ahead of time, and they'll get something saying that you know Heather's going to go live at two p.m. or whatever. Um, or when you you just hey, I could pull my phone up right now and go, hey guys, we're live. You know, everybody say hi, and it'll send all my followers a notification. Um, so it is pretty cool. So although next week they're going to decide that we can't do that either. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm a little bitter against Facebook right now. Um, all right, so yeah, everything points back to your significant piece of content. Um, one example, um, a client that I have is a fashion blogger. She does a lot of photo shoots, all that kind of stuff. So she's posting all over Instagram and Pinterest these you know beautiful photos of these beautiful clothes that I cannot afford. And <laughs> everything, though, whether it's Instagram, Pinterest, or Twitter, or whatever, it all points back to a blog post where she brings all those images together and then that's where she outlines like where you can buy it and how much it is and who's got it on sale and you know the things going on in her life and all that kind of stuff. So even in that world, you know, she's everywhere. And you know, she's on all the different social media channels, but all roads lead back to her blog where it's like a uh, accumulation of everything that she's posting all over the place, all right? Now, the really cool thing, and this is what starts to make your content more simple and that you don't stress about it. If you watch that sawdust and you look at the engagement and the questions that people are asking in that Facebook Live or uh, in response to your Twitter post or whatever, that's going to give you more ideas for new Spock, new significant pieces of content. So if you see that they're asking about this one certain part of your blog post, your video, whatever, expand on that and make it its own thing. 
It's literally like wash, rinse, and repeat. Like you can make this into a cycle where you're posting your significant content, you're throwing out your sawdust, and from that sawdust, from, from the ashes, rises a new significant piece of content, okay? So always be looking for what people are most interested in, what they engage with the most from your sawdust, because that's gonna lead you to your next significant piece of content. And you'll find like it's, it's related. You know, so you end up with this cycle, and then you don't have to continually be sitting in front of your computer going, okay, what am I going to write about today? Because you've got all this... It's like interest-driven. Yes, absolutely. It, you're serving your audience. She said it's, it's interest-driven, and it absolutely is, because you see what they're interested in, you see what they respond to, and then you continue to build on that, and you're solving their problems. So, like, you may actually post something that... Um, like an example I was thinking about earlier is like coffee shop. So let's say a coffee shop, they specialize in these handcrafted, amazing, you know, cups of coffee. And they're marketing to the busy mom because they've got a drive through window, for example. Well, they may find that the moms are like, hey, the coffee is amazing, but I really love that they have healthy snacks for my kids who are in the car with me. And you may go, huh, I never thought about that. And so then you can start going that direction about like the healthy snacks that you offer and how, you know, don't take your kids through the McDonald's line. You can get your caffeine and you can get a healthy snack for your kid at the same time. So you may find from your, uh, your feedback and your engagement with people something completely different that you didn't think of another problem that you can solve. Yes, sir. I know, uh, I do a lot of content in Urban Planner. He ended up committing to posting every day for a year. And what happened was certain topics just exploded. Mm -hmm. Ended up writing a book, basically. and then other things that he thought people were really interested in just fell down. Absolutely. He ended up writing a book, and then he created the audience for the book from all these discussions. And mm -hmm. he realized, oh, we really need to flush this out. This is very powerful. Yeah. So you you'll be amazed. Like so many people are like, oh well. I I'm my ideal audience, and this is something I'd really be interested in. And then you'll find that you have like zero likes and zero shares, and zero, and you're like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> and then you'll post something that you're like, and eh, they're not going to care, but I'm just going to throw it out there because, like, you know, I'm tired today. And you're going to find like it's like shared like crazy. It's like the next viral content, you know. I mean, you'll be shocked, but that's why I, I always say. Talk to your audience. Talk to your ideal customer. Talk to that person that you probably know some people. Like, you probably have a product or a solution that you're solving because you have the problem and because people around you have the problem. So talk to those people that you know have that problem and say, hey, is this, it's just like creating a new product. Is this a product you would be interested in? Ask, you know, to ask them the same thing, like, well, how would you like to learn about this product? How, where would you go to find this product? Where would you go to find information about this product? And if you're having trouble, too, the other thing, go to Google. You know, Google's your friend. When you start typing in, you know, let's say you're selling uh, pillows, for example, you know, when you start typing in, it gives you the suggestions. Pay attention to those. Start, you know, go incognito and search, start searching for your product or a problem related to your product. And you may find that Google already has some other things that you can talk about that you can address. You want to talk about helping your SEO? You know, if people are searching for it in Google, it's going to show up in those suggestions. Next thing you know, you've got content that's going to answer people's questions that they're already searching for. All right? So here's just an example. And I kept it limited to these because if I added more, it was going to make the text smaller and smaller, and I knew it was going to be hard to read already. <laughs> so let's say your significant piece of content is a video. And, you know, there's so many things that you can use off of that. So, you know, little video snippets, um, the transcript, the shorter blog article. We've already talked about these. Facebook Live Q&A. Pull quotes from the transcript that you post with pictures on Instagram or something like that. Pull the audio from your video to post as a podcast. It's not ideal. I realize that. All the podcasters in the room go, <gasps> uh, But it's not ideal. But it's another form of content that you can get out there. Create an infographic. And I know a lot of people are like, how in the world am I going to do that? Canva has, t has a bunch of templates for infographics. There's free templates for infographics that you can create in PowerPoint. Um, if you want to go to Fiverr and find a graphic designer to create you an infographic or something like that, there's that option too. Um, the other thing is creating lead magnets. So 
take your content and create a worksheet from it. Like, you know, let's say you've got a video or you've got a, a podcast or whatever, and a ton of podcasters are doing this now. In their content, they say, hey, I've got a worksheet that goes along with this, this podcast or with this content. Go download it at my website, you know, what a podcast number whatever. And when you go to download it, you put in your email to get it. So it uses a lead magnet, so they capture your email address to get the worksheet that goes along with the podcast. See how this all kind of like connects together, loops together? Yeah. There's so many different things. If you go to Google and search for like types of content, you're going to find all kinds of things like 45 types of content, 101 types of content, all that kind of stuff. You're going to find all kinds of ideas. And all you do is time back to your significant piece of content, the, 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 original, <laughs> the original Spock versus the new Spock, whether well, you like them or not. So tie it all back to your original content. So in summary, make sure you are identifying your customer as detailed as possible. The more detailed, the better. Give that person a name. Think about them as your best friend. Think about them every time you sit down to write content. All right? You're having a conversation with Sally or Heston, whatever his name is. Map out their story. It helps you understand where they are and it helps you show them where they can go with you. All right? Create your significant piece of content and then maximize the sawdust from it. And then what you're going to do is just rinse and repeat. Keep using the feedback from that sawdust to create new significant pieces of content. All right? So, there's my information. I believe in the story brand framework so much and I just decided this like 20 minutes ago. Shoot me an email at heatherandthedogs at gmail.com and just put WordCamp word or StoryBrand or whatever in the subject line. And when I get home tonight, I'll have my husband pick one of the emails and I'll send you the book for free. So I was like, I didn't have it built into my slides. I'm like, how can I do this? Shoot me an email, heatherandthedogs at gmail.com. And, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll have my husband pick somebody tonight when I get back to Nashville. And I'll, I'll send you an email. And All right. Can you add us to your email list just from that? I can. Yep. Yeah, I'll probably respond and ask you if you want to be added, because, um, like most people, I'm revising my website at the moment. <laughs> so, um, so uh, if if you want, I'll respond, or you can just put it in the email that you want to be added um, when I start when I get that back going with content and everything. So. Huh? Yeah, I'll have my I'll have Jack, my husband, do it. Yeah, I'll have him pick because he doesn't know anybody from here. So, just put WordCamp or Story Brand or content or whatever, whatever. I just, I just, I just went to Inbox Zero this morning, so it's all good. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I will post a link um, and I'll hashtag Word uh, W C A T L uh, WordCamp Atlanta. So just look at that hashtag and I'll post them this evening. So yeah. Where are you going to post them? I'll post them. I'll post it on Twitter. Okay. So you can either follow me. Twitter doesn't like how long my name is, so it's Heather the Dogs instead of Heather and the Dogs. So you can follow me, and I'll post it tonight. Um, I'll also use the hashtag WCATL, the hashtag for the event. So if you're following the hashtag, you'll see it that way too. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, I have a question about creating your avatar. Mm -hmm. When you were starting to do that, that's, that's what I struggle most with, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like starting with your clients that you're currently helping and, and identifying that, or do you recommend starting with what I'm really feeling? Your ideal, yeah. I don't know because so I, I think the answer to that is are you currently serving your ideal customer? And if you don't feel that you are, I would say I would say look at who your customers are right now. And what's the difference between them and your ideal customer? You want to base it on your ideal customer because, I mean, frankly, like if the customers that you have right now, as much as you value them, they're not the ideal customer. You want to get to your ideal customer. That avatar needs to be who you want to work with. It needs to be who you want to go after. Because if do I just choose or do I go find some real? I always say talk to real people. 
talking to real people is going to give you more feedback and it's going to because anybody can say anything online but when you talk to real people they give you real answers okay um, the thing is so what I was going to say too if you're not happy with the customers that you have right now if you continue to fish in that pond you're going to get the same fish so if you want different customers, you've got to go to different places to get them, right? So that's why I would say define, if, you're, if you love the customer base you have right now, you want to stick with them, that's great. Create your avatar based on those people. But if you want a different type of customer, you need to create a new avatar. Yes, ma'am. When you were talking about um, identifying their story, mm -hmm. sort of went through the story framework, is it really the problem part of their story that you're focusing on, or is there more than just that? It's not just the problem. It's how you're going to guide them through that problem, okay? And when you when you start digging into story brand with you know, whether it's the book or the podcast or whatever, it really breaks down the problem into three types. And, and so, so there's an internal problem, there's an external problem, and there's a philosophical problem. People do not buy based on their external problem; they buy because of the internal problem. Because what happens, the external problem is something that's happening to them. It's something that they're struggling with you know, outside in the world and everything. Um, so like um, the company that I work for, we do a lot with financial stuff. So the problem that people are facing externally is that they're living paycheck to paycheck. The internal problem is how they feel about the problem they're facing. So they feel lost, they feel hopeless, they feel overwhelmed. That's why they're buying our products is because they want to feel better about themselves and they want to be something different. So yeah, they're struggling with living paycheck to paycheck, but they really want to feel differently. And then the philosophical problem is like the whole good versus evil in the world. So for us, it's you shouldn't have to feel stressed about your money all the time. So it's, it's that, you know, like, um, in Star Wars, you know, Luke's, uh, the philosophical problem, what it comes down to is the good versus evil. So, yes ma'am. Any tips or a good source for an editorial content or editorial content calendar? Content calendar? I love co-schedule. Co-schedule? It's all one word. C-O schedule. Um, there's a bunch of people who have like different tools and templates and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's there's Excel based ones. There's you know all kind of you know, Word, all that kind of stuff. You can find a ton of them out there. I love CoSchedule. So CoSchedule has a plugin for WordPress, so it'll actually give you your content calendar in WordPress. They have a paid version, but last time I checked, that plugin uh, was free that you could use and it actually creates a calendar and you can start your posts in the calendar and it shows your posts in that calendar uh, and when you want to start sharing it with other people and having team members and all that kind of stuff I think there's a fee for it but I think that calendar within WordPress that plugin is for free so but co, co schedule is my favorite. Are you familiar with Ops Calendar at all? Ops Calendar? No I haven't it's seen that. Brian Castle. Yeah Ops uh -huh. Calendar is another one. OPS <laughs> Calendar. Is that a plugin? Uh, yes, it's the same thing as mm -hmm. co schedule. It's like it helps you schedule all your content. Like, yeah. There's a lot of different options there. What I'm going to say is I may like co-schedule, but you, it might not work for you in terms of like the way you work. And that's what I'm going to say is don't ever try to make a tool fit you. Find another tool. Because if you have to put a lot of effort into using it, you're not going to use it. That comes from somebody who like downloads every tool available. <laughs> so. <laughs> Because there's so many options out there. Really, there, I don't really think there's anything that like corners the market, and there's not other options available. So, yes, ma'am. Uh huh. That slide. Okay. Yep. I'd love to see the one before it. This one. Thank you. Yeah, and I mean, y'all, this list could go on and on and on and on. Again, I, I was trying to think how small the text was going to be because I know it's hard for me to read from the back room, too. So, any other questions? So, I don't know if the happiness bar is, uh, is still open. I'm going to stick around if you have any questions that you want to come talk about. I'm happy to talk with you. Feel free to shoot me an email, connect with me on social media. We can chat there as well. Um, I'm always happy to help other people overcome their fear of, uh, of content. So, all right, thanks, y'all.